this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are taking a look at some Super Bowl 56 futures with Nick Costos of You Better You Bet, getting his favorite thoughts there and some values he likes in that Super Bowl market. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com and find him on Twitter at ThePowerRank and Ed. Busy couple of weeks. You were in Vegas. You've got Bet Bash going on tonight. I had the FanDuel Fan Fest in Denver where I said to bet the under on the Broncos win total and had stuff thrown at me on a stage. So uh, we're, we're cooking with gas here. It is, <laughs> it is August. And we are loving life. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm doing really busy. Uh, I'm doing really busy. I am very busy. We are all very busy. If you don't work in sports, uh, like August is is by far the busiest time getting ready for a football season uh football season obviously matters the most in in the american sports world so and of course i made it all the busier by planning two trips right back to back these past two weeks but vegas was awesome it's kind of nice to not be wearing a mask and in a casino doing the episode this week like i was uh last week but that was kind of fun with the atmosphere being in the south point casino and then as soon as we're done recording here i'm headed to new york for bet bash which um can't possibly not be a good time so i'm looking forward to that as well and uh you know maybe maybe by mid-september uh my heart rate will have settled down and uh get on with the rest of the football season what's on your schedule for bet bash uh show up <laughs> hang out <laughs> no I, I, I'm, um yeah i don't know let's see i'm having dinner with some people going to bet bash i think i'm supposed to do a live recording with with uh, Hops and Props, uh, a podcast uh, that that I've been on before. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. Who, who knows where the night will lead, but we'll see. Well, cool. I hope that goes well. Uh, Fan to a Fan Fest was a blast. That was at yeah, Power Field in Denver. Um, we did a sports betting panel. Uh, Lisa Kearney hosted. And then Aaron Dolan, who we've had in the show, and Liv Moods, who we've had in the show as well, Olivia Moody. Uh, we did a, a panel with them and uh, talked through our futures, which – Maybe I shouldn't have been. I mean, like, I don't, I'm never going to say like something dishonest, but like, maybe I shouldn't have been like as certain that the Broncos would go under eight and a half. But like, you know, uh, there are also not a lot <laughs> of Cowboys that... fans in the crowd. So that, that didn't fly yeah. super well either. But like, it was fun, man. Uh, I got to, we got to see the chain smokers after. I've never listened to chain smokers that much, but like, it was free. It was fun. Uh, I had a blast. It was great. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw you went to the Rockies game. Yep. And there uh, wasn't there some like football throwing competition in the parking lot the next day or something on Sunday. So that was yeah, that was that was on Sunday. I didn't do the football toss uh, because you know I got a I, like Matt and Nagy three Cohen a couple years ago in the preseason. I got to keep that under lock so no one knows how good I am throwing footballs. Obviously, yeah. it's not because I played offensive line and can't throw worth a darn uh it's definitely because i gotta keep it a secret i did a a pit crew competition uh they had like a nascar tire there he tried to like uh unscrew the lug nuts i was terrible so this is why i bet on nascar and don't work on a pit crew but uh i wanted a second shot didn't have time to get there i'm hoping they do another one and i can try it again because it was a. Uh, pretty embarrassing but either way it was fun yeah uh, i hope that bash is fun as well i hope that vegas yeah. went well it's a very busy time of year for us also busy time of year for nick costos we're gonna talk with him in just a bit get his thoughts on super bowl 56 and some futures find nick on twitter at the costos he is of course the host of you better you bet on odyssey which you can find a lot of different places right now. So we'll talk to Nick about that. Talk to Nick about his thoughts on this upcoming year. Of course, uh, we've had a bunch of NFL previews already. We had Edward Egros on win totals last week. Aaron Dolan, who I talked about before, uh, talked about divisional outrights. JJ Zacharyson talked player props with us. We also had Drew Martin on talking some college football next week. Uh, college football week one, week zero is this week. So maybe some more college coming up in the near future. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. And search for Covering the Spread on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, 
wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. And while you're there, leave us a rating and review as well. We'll talk to Nick in just one second. But first, hey, sports fans, FanDuel is offering an exclusive promotion for new sportsbook users. Join FanDuel Sportsbook today and make your first bet. If you lose, we'll give you a refund up to $1,000 in site credit within 72 hours. Your first bet after depositing will qualify if you have multiple selections on one bet slip. It'll be the first selection you made. Head over to FanDuel Sportsbook today and place your first bet. Must be 21 plus and present in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. New users only. Max refund $1,000 site credit. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 1-800-889-9789 or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Covering the present. Let's bring Nick Costos into covering the spread to talk some Super Bowl 56 futures with the season just around the corner. Nick, I know it is a crazy time of year for you. How you hanging in there, given everything that's going on right now? Oh man, you just gotta you gotta push through. You gotta make it happen. This is uh this is this is it. This is the time of year. With all apologies to you know the NCAA tournament, the NBA playoffs, baseball, etc. There's nothing like football season. And football season, like I say on you better you bet, is on nigh, which is like a really fancy way of saying it's like right around the corner. So yeah, really excited and ready to go. Week one, Sunday, September 12th, Thursday, September 9th. Uh, very exciting, and I uh, just can't wait for the games to start because we've been talking about this set of 16 games for what seems like an eternity. Right. And, you know, we talk about offseason, we use that word, but I feel like for you, there hasn't really been one because you better, you bet's been like blowing up. You've got uh, stuff expanding new announcements all the time. What have the past couple of months been like for you with it, it seeming like you're kind of everywhere right now? Yeah, it's cool. And I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, like it's been great with Odyssey, you know, um, you better, you bet as a, well, you, the show hasn't expanded, but like BetQL has expanded the BetQL network right. and uh, the company's commitments uh, to like to, to sports betting, right? So expanding to a bunch of different markets with the plan being for us to continue to expand to different markets. They've got a lot of cool plans and like, I'm not trying to make it seem like I'm like, like, like holding the plans to the Death Star at bay here. It's not like it's anything earth shattering, but there's lots of cool stuff that we've got on the hopper coming up for the start of the season. So it's really fun for me personally. I don't think it's that much of a change. You know, I get asked sometimes and I don't say this braggadociously, it's just the truth. Like, Hey, like what's your preparation life for your show? And I say like, Hey, like I get up in the morning, like I love sports just like you guys do. Like I'm sure the listeners do like we get up and we're into sports, whether it's baseball, basketball, the NHL playoffs, college basketball, NFL, uh, college football, soccer, golf. I like all this stuff. So for me, it's, it's not really that big of a change because I'm following this stuff anyway. So I, I would say it's not really that much of a change. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that because uh, we are gearing up for what should be a fun point in the year as well. It's it's busy, but it's a fun busy. I'll take a fun busy every day of the week. Now, let's talk about some training camp here, Nick, because we've got training camp info. We've gotten some news out there. And I think one of the tougher things is always trying to balance how much should we care about this stuff. So has anything occurred outside of injuries? Because I think those are obvious. Outside of injuries during training camp, that has altered your view of a team entering this year? Can I give you, instead of training camp, can I give you like preseason instead? Yes, and like, I, and I want to use a team as an example here. Um, I think my opinion of the Jets has been has been altered here by a couple different things. The first would be the, the season-ending injury suffered by Carl Lawson, I think is like a major deal. And like, we talked about this on You Better, You Bet. Like as far as like, the spread of a game. I don't know that Carl Lawson is a spread impact player where he doesn't play in a game and the line moves, right? I don't know. He's not like Aaron Donald in that respect, right? But I think that on this defense, given like the lack of other talent that they've got on the defense, in order for this defense to be successful, I kind of think you needed that combination of Lawson and Quentin Williams on the defensive line. So I think, you know, even with Robert Sala there, and, and I think you saw this with Sala in San Francisco, this isn't even a knock on Sala. Like, when, when all the good players were healthy, that defense was absolutely awesome. And when some of these players got hurt, the defense wasn't as good. Like, I think that would be the case with a lot of great coaches in the National Football League. Like, it's hard to win. Belichick won 7-9 and nine last year with that Patriots team, right? Even the best coaches can struggle when you don't have the talent there. So I think that that loss and injury is a big deal. Again, maybe not on, like, makes you want to bet a season under win total or like that. But I think, and I'll, I will get to kind of what I mean 
um, with my the way the difference that I look in the Jets here. But I think it plays a big deal in terms of game by game in the individual handicaps. And on the flip side, there, you know, I don't know that Zach Wilson's going to step in and be, you know, Peyton Manning in 1998 with the passing yards or what we saw Justin Herbert be last year. But I also think he's he's been awesome in the preseason, and I know it's been against backups, but like he's showing a lot of poise. He's got an absolute cannon. I look at Corey Davis, and I'm like, this guy's the Julio Jones in this offense. Now he's not as good as Julio, but in the Shanahan Lafleur offense here, he's going to get a billion targets. Elijah Moore is going to be back at some point. Like I like Michael Carter. Like if Bakai Becton works himself into shape with Oliveira Tucker on the left side of that line here. What I'm getting at here is like. I think the Jets are going to be an over team this year, at least to start the year. And I don't mean over in terms of win total. I mean over in terms of points scored in their games. So like week one against the Panthers, you guys tell me how like that should be the second lowest total of the week when there's so much unknown with both teams, with the Panthers, with Sam Darnold and this new offense with Joe Brady, with, with the new quarterback in Darnold, and then with the Jets, with the new rookie quarterback in the new offensive scheme here, how that total can be 43 is beyond me here. So I'm sure the market can adjust as time goes on here, but at least early in the season, like that's one example I would say where I have seen something in training camp or the preseason where I'm like, okay, this kind of did change the way I uh, I look at a team heading into the year. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the the rookie quarterback can do. I mean, there, there are always doubts about that. Nick, I wanted to ask you more about how you're viewing kind of long-term bets, right? It's not 2020. We don't have the mass uncertainty that we had last year, but 2021 we still have some uncertainties with uh the pandemic um how is your confidence level in betting season-long win totals champion futures division odds so on and so forth um i i kind of like try and not think about that i just think it's such like an <laughs> well it's i i don't even mean to be glib when i say that i just think it's like right. such an impossible thing right to handicap i mean like uh, you know, we're a year plus into COVID and I still feel like there's like so much unknown. Um, it's, you know, I have uh, a friend who's the husband had it, sleeps in the same bed with his wife. Wife never got COVID. Like they, they both got tested. Like that's a thing that happens. That may be abnormal, like for what a lot of people have experienced. But I, my, my point is, is that I guess we don't know, right? So I think it's like, I know people want to say, oh, well, you know, Kirk Cousins, for example, or like the Cam Newton situation at Patriots camp, like unvaccinated players, whatever. I, I, I just feel like we just, we don't know. And I'm not willing to make that a part of my handicap. And I just don't know. So I am maybe foolishly, maybe we come to the end of the season and I'm like, man, like this cost me some money here. Kind of look like an idiot. Um, it's possible. So it wouldn't be the, wouldn't be the first time. It wouldn't be the, won't be the last, you know, but I I'm trying like to not make it a part of my handicap. And just, cause I just feel like who the hell knows what could happen. It could happen. It could not happen. So I'm kind of operating under the assumption that things will be kosher, which obviously they probably won't be, but who the hell knows where like the bomb's going to go off. So to speak, maybe that's a bad analogy, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Does it impact your willingness to bet the futures market in general, given that we actually, like you said, we don't know how to impact stuff. Are you betting futures at the same rate as you did previously? Have you scaled back, scaled up maybe even potentially, or is it pretty much a status quo for you? Yeah, I think it's probably about, about the same as what I've got. I feel pretty good about a bunch of them here. I, I'll, let's, I'll talk about the Vikings for a second. Like, look, obviously, you know, the Vikings are really interesting because, you know, we've barely seen Cousins play in the preseason in the first two games. And when we did, he was getting sacked by Quiddy Pay of the Indianapolis Colts. These the backups for Minnesota are like not not striking fear in the hearts of anybody. Like maybe Kellen Mond like can turn into something, but you know, Jake Browning's absolutely terrible. He's awful, right? So if I like I like Minnesota's win total of nine because I feel like at worst, like you push on that bet. Um Detroit's obviously gonna be bad. Like by design, I think they're gonna be bad. Um Chicago's offensive line is so brutal that I don't think it matters who they start a quarterback. Like I, I would like to be bullish on them with fields, but the line is absolutely terrible. So it's hard to feel good about them. Vikings are getting so many pieces back on defense. You know, Daniel, Daniel Hunter chief among them here, you know, the offensive line in theory should be better than it's been in the Kirk Cousins era. Once they get Christian Darris saw back the first round pick from injury, the left tackle. So I feel like at worst, you kind of like push Vikings over nine, but I mean, if cousins is going to miss time and it's like Ketlin Mond or Jake Browning, like, they're in big trouble. So, you know, like I acknowledge that that's maybe I should kind of take it more into consideration, but maybe foolishly I'm kind of operating under the assumption that we're going to see cousins and these guys play the full season and whatever happens happens. But like, that's, that's one that I like. And I say, I'd say I have about the same amount of futures bets right now. Okay, perfect. So that's, that's good to know. So let's talk about some Super Bowl futures then. talk about some teams you may be on for this year. But I think before we talk about 
who you want to bet. We have to talk about who you can bet because not every team has the upside to win the Super Bowl. Like there is a limited number of teams, at least in my mind, who can actually do it. So to you, Nick, when you're looking at the landscape for this year, how many teams, like you don't have to be exact, but like roughly how many teams do you reach the threshold of being a viable Super Bowl contender in 2021? All right, so I think let's include like theoretical upside, right, in this conversation. So yeah. these are teams that are maybe not like valued highly now to potentially win a championship, but teams that I think would have the theoretical upside to win a Super Bowl championship. So we can kind of go by division. In the AFC East, Buffalo, obviously. I also think the Dolphins' theoretical upside is to win a Super Bowl if two is awesome. Like, I think on average, the Patriots win more regular season games than Miami. But I think that Miami's ceiling is higher than New England's because of the ceiling of Tua Tagovailoa in year number two in this offense with all the weapons they've got. So again, like I'm, I'm actually saying that I think it's more likely if you play the regular season out like a hundred times, the Patriots would have more wins than the Dolphins. But I don't think the Patriots can win a Super Bowl, and I think the Dolphins' upside, if two is great, which I think is a reasonable possibility that the Dolphins' upside is to win a Super Bowl. So Buffalo and Miami, Baltimore and Cleveland, I think, in the AFC North. I don't think Pittsburgh's upside is to win a championship this year. Defense will regress. Offensive line is bad. I don't think any team in the AFC South can reasonably do it. I don't think Tennessee's defense is good enough. AFC West, Chargers and Chiefs, like the Chargers' theoretical upside is definitely to win a Super Bowl. Not saying that they're going to be better than Kansas City, but like things break right. They could potentially go on a deep playoff run. Denver's interesting because I think if they end up, like if reports are true and like we've seen them play a lot of like heavy personnel in the preseason. So if they decide to play like two tight ends, the Fant and Alberto, they got a lot of depth on defense. Defense should be good. And Teddy's going to be the starter. And like they're going to play ball control and not try and turn the ball over and lean on their defense. I think Denver becomes a lot more interesting, but we can leave Denver out just because I don't think Locke and Teddy kind of have that upside to win a championship. I don't think any team in the AFC East does. Probably just the Packers in the NFC North, just the Bucks in the NFC South. And I guess like you could say three teams in the NFC West, just for the sake of conversation. Russ, I think, elevates Seattle to that level. The Rams, I don't think we'll get there, but theoretically could. And obviously the 49ers, I think, ceiling is to get to a Super Bowl championship as well. So I think that's your your bucket of teams to choose from. So you still feel pretty good about the night. I mean, you know, I I, I think the vast majority of those teams have a solid situation at the quarterback position, you know, the two that don't are Denver and San Francisco. So you feel like there's enough upside. I mean, I like both those teams on, oh, well, I like particularly Denver on the defensive side of the ball. Um, but maybe with the Niners, how much does a quarterback controversy maybe get you off that take? Well, Any I just, yeah. yeah, I just want to say about Denver. Like, I don't, I, I just think Denver becomes more interesting. Like as like an over team potentially, or like week mm -hmm. one against the Giants as a road favorite here, if it's Teddy and they're going to kind of change the way they play as opposed to last year when it's locked, slinging it around and throwing tons of picks. So I don't think Denver's upside is to win a Super Bowl this year with the quarterback okay. situation. But like, I do think they become a lot more interesting if it's Teddy and they kind of change the way they play. Um, With San Francisco, um, the quarterback controversy doesn't really, um, move me off them at all. I think what we've seen with San Francisco, and this is kind of proven to be true in like the whole Kyle Shanahan era, they get in trouble when a quarterback gets hurt. And then it's like CJ Beathard or like Nick Mullins. So I think they ride Jimmy Garoppolo until the wheels fall off, either until Jimmy sucks or until Jimmy gets hurt. And then Trey Lance comes in and then like, you know, and it adds like a different dimension here. Now the game, I think in, at moments, I know that Twitter is kind of like goo goo gaga for Lance and for Justin Fields, and for the other rookie quarterbacks, and I understand that. Um, Lance's fastball is unbelievable, man. Like, he made some throws in the preseason this weekend that are like, oh, my God, like, holy bleep throws from Lance. The athleticism's obviously there. But, you know, we had on You Better You Bet this week, two guys that have forgotten more about football than I'll ever know, Brian Baldinger and Mike Lombardi, our Odyssey NFL insiders. And they, they say, like, the game right now is moving a little fast for Trey Lance. So I don't think it's the worst thing in the world if Jimmy ends up starting, plays until either, like, he stinks, like, and Kyle's like, I've had enough. Or if he gets hurt, which we don't want to happen, but has happened with Jimmy Garoppolo in the past. And, and kind of in comes Trey Lance. So I kind of look at the 49ers as, like, they've got a fallback plan this year in case things go awry at the quarterback position. Whether it's Lance starts and Lance can't get the job done and in comes Jimmy G or vice versa. 
So I, I actually feel pretty good about the Niners either way as we head into the season. Yeah, I think that that boosts their floor a lot, and they've shown in the past they have a ceiling when things are right. Like Jimmy Garoppolo has been an above average, from an efficiency perspective, above average quarterback in this system. He's not. They went to the Super Bowl. They, right, they, they, exactly. They, yeah, they had a lead going into the fourth quarter two years ago in the Super Bowl. Like I'm not One saying overthrow that overthrow in their Super Bowl champions. Yeah, right? and that's yeah. A, it's a really bad overthrow, obviously. But I know that right. I know that we all we all recognize that. But yeah, I mean, right. I'm not saying Jimmy G's great or that. He has the ceiling of Trey Lance. Like, he doesn't. Like, Lance is going to be the guy, obviously, probably sooner rather than later, and that's what it should be. But uh, but it's not like Jimmy's a loser, you know? Like, he, he gets hurt, right. throws some bad passes sometimes. But, man, like, he did go to a Super Bowl a couple years ago. Like, I don't think we that can be discounted. Year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that their range of outcomes is good. And I think that, that I would agree with you that the ceiling is there where they could realistically make that happen. So speaking of ceiling, let's talk. Bucks and Chiefs, uh, they are uh, five to one and plus six fifty respectively. Uh, any lingering value in either of those teams, Nick? Given that they are the, the the favorites here, or is that too short of a number for you to bet? Uh, you know, despite how good they are, um, I I think there's still value with Tampa. Um, I look at the Bucks this year, and I'm curious if you guys agree with this. I think they have the opportunity, and I'm not like planting my flag in down and being like, hey, like this is absolutely going to happen. But I think there's a good chance it could happen. Um, and I think it correlates to a couple different bets where I, I think we could realistically look back on this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team five, 10, 20 years from now and say, this is one of the better teams we've seen maybe in the history of the National Football League. Like, I think they they actually have that upside to be legitimately historically great this year. Everybody coming back. Joe Tryon looks ridiculous, obviously, the rookie pass rusher. Now you put him with Shaq Barrett and Jason Pierre-Paul. Um and the, the NFC is just not as good as the AFC, right? Like, I don't see any team in the NFC East challenging Tampa. Green Bay would be the one team in the North. I, I guess, like, people will make the case for the Niners or the Rams or the Seahawks. I'm not going to. So I think Tampa's clearly the best team in the conference here. I I, I think their upside is to go 15-2 and two or 16-1 and one in the regular season. Like, not saying it's definitely going to happen. In a 17-game regular season, they may have things wrapped up early and sit guys down the stretch. Like that's a realistic possibility. So I'm not saying they can oh, they can definitely reach those lofty goals here, but I think Tampa is the best team in football, not Kansas City. Now that's not meant to be a knock on the Chiefs, more meant to be a compliment to Tampa. I think you know we could very well be staring down the barrel of a Tampa Kansas City Super Bowl rematch here. But I like Tampa plus 650 if I had to choose between one of those two because I think Tampa's more likely to get to the Super Bowl than Kansas City is because of the path. And I think a correlated bet to make with Tampa, and curious if you guys agree with this, and I know like when we talk about coach of the year, it's generally a situation where like a new coach comes in and, you know, exceeds expectations or the team improves by like four games, whatever. Like Kevin Stefanski did it last year. You know, we've seen this happen numerous times with coach of the year, but I'll direct you guys to the 2007 New England Patriots. It's just one example of this happening where the Patriots in 2006 go 11 and five. Um, we're up 21, three in Indianapolis in the AFC championship game. Asante Samuel picks six of Peyton Manning. We think it's all over. Patriots going to be Peyton again. Here comes the big comeback, right? And the Colts win 38, 34 cover the three and a half point spread. I remember because I bet it on that championship Sunday in 2006. And, uh, and the next year the Patriots go 16 and 0. Obviously, undefeated regular season, Belichick wins coach of the year. So it wasn't like they were, you know, four and 12, went nine and seven the next year, one coach of the year. So like there's historical precedent for this happening. If if Tampa went 11 and five last year, didn't even win their division. If Tampa goes 15 and two this year or 16 and one, why can't Bruce Arians win coach of the year at 22 to one? Like, why can't that happen? You also have the media narrative built in there where Arians has two coach of the years already under his belt with two different teams. Won it with Indianapolis as the interim coach when Chuck Pagano had to step down with leukemia with Andrew Luck and then won it in Arizona with Carson Palmer and the Cardinals. So Arians is a guy that the media loves. This would be his third coach of the year with three different teams. So I think that's something that plays into his favor perhaps here. Like, I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, obviously. I just think that at 22 to one, if we actually reasonably think that Tampa's an outcome for them could be 15 and two, 16 and one historic type of regular season. Why can't Bruce Arians win coach of the year at an inflated number? You can actually get it at an even better price at FanDuel. 30 to 1 for Bruce Arians. Longer than... Well, you know, I'm a Bet Rivers guy. I know this is a FanDuel right. no, uh, yeah, show, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yes, you, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but he's longer than Urban Meyer. Longer than Mike Vrabel, Mike McCarthy, Vic Fangio, Joe Judge. 
That's Yikes. interesting. So I think that's that's pretty interesting there for sure. Okay, let's step down from that top tier. To watch, they're going to watch. Brady will get hurt, and they're going to win like four games, and he's going right. to retire to go to go play no, no, golf in Florida for the rest of his on, life. But hold on, Nick. But I think I, I want to bring this point up because you, you I, I personally, what what you just said, I believe there's a wide range of outcomes for Tampa Bay. I believe they could be the best team in the NFL. I believe Brady could finally start acting 43 years old, right? And I really enjoy because you said this similarly with Miami, right? It's not just you know, some people, some teams have a higher variance than others. And I enjoy that you're bringing that out about teams because I think that's the right way to think about a lot of these bets, especially when you're looking at low probability thing like winning a Super Bowl. All right, on to you, Jim. Yeah, so I think that, that finding variance is good in a lot of situations. Let's talk about the second tier. Uh, if we see value in the Bucks at plus 650, Nick, any value for you and teams like the Packers, Bills, Ravens, 49ers, Rams, and Browns in that second tier, the 12 to 16 to 1 type tier? Anybody in that group stand out, or do the Bucks kind of push you away from betting in this second tier? I, I kind of like Miami if we're going to get past that, going to get past okay. that tier here. And again, like I, the acknowledgement here is that Miami's floor is to win like six games this year if Tua sucks, right? Which you have to, I'm a, I'm a Tua truther. I think two is going to be awesome. I like the way this offense is going to be catered around him as opposed to last year with Fitz. Love the weapons here. Flores, I think, is shown to be a good coach. A lot of talent on defense if the offensive line is not absolutely brutal. I, I think Miami's upside is to win a Super Bowl championship and Tua's upside is to be MVP. Like, I think that that is within the range of outcomes. Again, so, they could also Nick, my suck. only Super Bowl, my only MVP bet this year at Bet Rivers, there you go, uh, 66 nice. to 1, Tua Tunga Vailoa. I'm Love on board, it. man. Love it. I think the yep. other one in, in that tier, um, I I really like Buffalo. I think Buffalo is the third best team in football. Um, what are the fan duel prices right now on Buffalo and Baltimore? Uh, let me find that for you. Um, for Super Bowl? Yes. Okay. So to win the Super Bowl, Buffalo is 12 to 1, Baltimore 14. I I think I... I don't, I, li- I really like both of these teams. I like both of them. Um, I think, and um, this may be something you guys disagree with also, I think Cleveland's is more likely to have a better regular season than Baltimore, but I think Baltimore's upside is higher than Cleveland's. Like, I give Baltimore a better chance to win the championship, to win a Super Bowl, than I do the Browns. Um, I think this Baltimore passing game, obviously, not film at 11 here, is going to struggle you know, Hollywood Brown is barely practiced with the hand. Like, you don't want a speed guy to have a hamstring. That's that's problematic. Bateman's going to be out until October with the groin. So, I mean, I think it's going to take some time for Baltimore's offense to round into shape. But, I mean, you know, my co-host on You Better You Bet, Ken Barkley, Lockie Lockerson, made a really interesting analogy, drew an interesting analogy with Baltimore um, last week on the show. And it's not apples to apples. So we're not saying it's the same exact thing. But, like, Baltimore's kind of like the Milwaukee Bucks coming into the year here, right, where – You've got the former MVP, and it's like people are tired of Baltimore now. Like, got into the playoffs a couple times, three years here with Lamar. You know, they they finally got over the hump, and they won their first game thanks to some Mike Vrabel stupidity at the end of that wild card game in Tennessee. And then Lamar throws the pick six. Uh, we ended up losing a teaser on Baltimore in that game because Justin Tucker oh. missed like nine field goals, and Lamar threw that 100-yard pick six, which is aggravating. But it's like people are kind of like out on Baltimore, I feel like, as far as the ceiling is concerned, like to get to the Super Bowl this year. And I think Baltimore's got like not a terribly easy schedule to start the year. Like they see the Chiefs in week two. They never beat Kansas City. So maybe wait on Baltimore a little bit if you want to make like a futures bet on Baltimore to win the Super Bowl here. Buffalo – I think Buffalo's upside is to be like, again, like 14 and three this year. Um, I, I know some people kind of like are down on Buffalo a little bit. I don't understand how you could be like the offense is going to be sick. Josh Allen's going to have a great season. I, I kind of like, don't see it. And like, if Rousseau is going to be awesome, the first round pass rusher and AJ Epineza is going to be good as well, which he has been in the preseason and training camp. Like this defensive line has the opportunity to get after that ass man and bring down the opposing quarterback. And that's something that was missing last year for Buffalo. So B- yeah. Buffalo and Baltimore, I think are two teams that I target there. You know, it's interesting. All these teams that I'm talking about are from the AFC, which is again, why right. I'm like, right. I really like Tampa, obviously to come out of the NFC. Yep. No, yeah, I agree. I mean, with Buffalo, like I, I, I think their past defense kind of underperformed. I think they have more potential with players in the second year too, which is why I also uh, am high on a team that I, couldn't have imagined being high on uh, a year ago. Um, yeah, Nick, before we let you go, um, we don't want to restrict you to Super Bowl odds. So is there anything else in the futures market, NFL-wise, that you are interested in? Um, I think defensive player of the year. 
present some pretty interesting odds and potential value. Um, call awesome. me square, and that's okay. Um, I like Chase Young a lot. I think he's 12 to 1 right now at Bed Rivers. Uh, I look in the first preseason game against the Patriots, like I think it's pretty well acknowledged, right? That Isaiah Wynn, the Patriots left tackle, is like an ascending left tackle. Like could right. one day be like one of the bet one of the best left tackles in football. Chase Young made him look like an amateur in that preseason. And I get it's the preseason, but just that this dude's ceiling, I just feel like is is absolutely monstrous. So Chase Young at 12 to 1 is someone that I look at. You know, Von Miller coming off the ACL last year. Mm-hmm. He's 33 to one right now at Ben Rivers. Um, like the Von Miller, like first ballot hall of famer, Super Bowl MVP under the, uh, under the old resume already. And like these two guys kind of check the boxes of like who wins defensive player of the year. Like I think in like the history of this award, at least in the last like 20 years, I am fairly certain. And please correct me if I'm wrong. JJ Watt with his probably steroid induced season um, when he won his first defensive player of the year is like the only guy to like come out of like nowhere. Right. And obviously like, it's not confirmed that Watt was on steroids and being a little glib there, obviously that (laughs) Watt is, Watt is like the only guy to like come out of nowhere. Like that doesn't happen with defensive player of the year. Right. You, you've got a pro bowl, at least one, right. You've got an all pro team probably. So it's like guys that have had some success in the past before. So I think like Derwin James could be a stud with the chargers this year. I would never bet Derwin James to be defensive player of the year. Darius Leonard is a guy that makes a lot of sense to me. 33 to one. Um, I don't think Indy's going to be very good, which may hurt his kind of ceiling here, but I mean, he's going to rack up uh, all the counting stats that you need in terms of the tackles. I texted a lot of people in the NFL. And I mean that seriously, I worked for the NFL media for 10 years for Sirius XM NFL radio. So like, I actually do have sources in the NFL, um, not with other sports, but with the NFL, I do. Everyone likes Devin white things like this is the monster season for Devin white, where he like announces himself to the world as the best defensive player on what could be the best team in football. Um, Devin white right now is 33 to one. I think Tredavious white is really interesting, right? I think he's also 33 to one. And, and Ed, I know you mentioned Buffalo secondary, having a lot of great players. He's the best one. If Buffalo is going to have this monster season, he's the best player. Like, why can't he be like Stefan Gilmore in 2019? Like the best defensive player on one of the best teams that wins defensive player of the year. So I think that market is really interesting. Offensive rookie of the year. I'd probably bet like whichever rookie quarterback is going to start the most games at the best odds, which right now is Zach Wilson at plus 700 max eight to one right now. Um, but we don't know if Mac's going to start the full complement of games. And I think in the history of the award, like no rookie quarterback with the exception of Herbert last year has started less than 16 games and won the award. And like, obviously right. like the Chargers team, Dr. Punctured Teron Taylor's team, they didn't want to play him. Um, so yeah, it's like whichever rookie quarterback's going to start 17 games or at least enters the season as the starter and has the best odds right now. That looks like it's Zach Wilson. That's who I'd look to bet for offensive rookie of the year. And if like the Patriots name Mac, the starter, and he's eight to one, I bet Mac. So those are some of the other individual awards that I'm looking at. And Jim, like you mentioned, Tua is my long shot MVP play. I love it. Love to hear it. Uh, I also love the correlated thoughts with Bruce Arians, Devin White, uh, the Bucs Super Bowl. Thinking that way, I think, is always smart when it comes to the futures market. Until they suck. Costumes, Until they but... suck and I lose all my money. But yeah. Yeah, but like if they suck, it's 30 to 1. You know, at least at least you were out on a ledge. At least you had, you know, that's it, that's baked in. So, you know, we're all good there. That cool. is Nick Costos. Check him out on Twitter at the Costos and check out You Better You Bet on Odyssey. Nick, we appreciate the time. Good luck this year. I hope we'll talk to you again soon. Good luck to you guys as well. Look forward to having you guys on You Better You Bet this season and talking to you on this show down the road. Thank you. Excited to be here. Thank you. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Nick Costos for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on Super Bowl 56 futures. And Ed, talking about the Broncos, I think that the way that Nick was discussing that kind of does tie back into a discussion that we had a couple weeks ago where I was talking about the Broncos and what I had to do to get them to be an eight and a half win team where I needed to make Teddy Bridgewater or Drew Locke be a league average passer. That got them to eight and a half wins. So if you can find a way to make them above average, there is some upside in there. So I think that the way he was discussing it was correct. And although I like the under, I I, I think that the, the range of outcomes here is pretty wide. And that does include at least some sort of a ceiling on that team. If it's not Super Bowl winning upside, there is a ceiling there. Um. Well, yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's certainly a ceiling, but... I, I kind of see this maybe like last, la, uh, potentially like Denver's last Super Bowl winning team, just because I see some upside in the defense. They brought in Kyle Fuller, which which is a guy that Vic Fangio has liked and, and played with before. Uh, definitely an above average NFL cornerback that doesn't get hurt. You had Bryce Callahan, who was one of the, the top graded cornerbacks in the league last year by PFF. And then 
and then and then you draft Patrick Sertan, who, from what well, what the scouts say, is high floor cornerback. Uh, maybe not the highest ceiling of anyone that got drafted, but but a very high floor. So, look, it's idiocy to uh, project too much about coverage and secondary because it regresses so much from year to year. But if any team's kind of going to make a jump, I mean, they they were a top ten defense last year. If anyone's going to make a jump even further. You get Von Miller back on the defensive side of the ball. You end up being one of the at least top five best defenses. And then you get average quarterback play from Teddy Bridgewater. You know, and and like, yeah, I don't know. I I, I potentially I see some hope with with this Denver team. Um, and uh, yeah. So, anyways, I, I think I think it's interesting. I, I I would not. I would definitely not go over. I've not. I sorry. I would definitely not go under on the team. I've not bet the over. Because I'm not again. It, it's so volatile with defense from year right. to year. But I do think that with those two new pieces and getting Von Miller back from injury, that defense has the potential to be really good. I think that ties something we discussed at the FanDuel Fan Fest. Lisa asked me, you know, so you like the under? Would you bet them to miss the playoffs, which is minus one ninety? And I said no because I recognize that the range of outcomes is so wide. I think that their median, their median projection is seven wins. And that's that's under. However, I think that they have upside, and therefore I didn't want to lay minus one ninety that they that they missed, despite the fact they're in right. the AFC West with the Chiefs and the Chargers, stuff like that. I, I can't lay minus one ninety in a situation like that. So although I like the under, I respect the fact that they have the path to being a good team, and that's why minus one ninety was too much for you to pay there. So I just like the way that Nick thinks about these things, uh, talks about it, and uh, it seems like has the correct line of thought process when it comes to dissecting what upside actually is and what volatility is and viewing upside or volatility in the proper sense in terms of betting. So let's move now into covering the future for this week. And Ed, you're talking about the Titans. We've alluded to them a couple of times, but not in depth. And it sounds like Ryan Tannehill was a guy who popped up in your annual quarterback study. Now, what does that do for you with the Titans and their win total at nine? Yeah, I mean, I, I I like the under here. I think I think Tennessee is a little bit uh, overrated. Uh, it definitely starts with Tanny Hill. So he's he's clearly been really good over the past two years since he replaced Marcus Mariota. Um, but as I've talked about, you know, some of my research has shown how uh, you know interceptions from last season or interception rate from last season isn't a very good predictor of what's going to go forward. Um, but when you look at bad balls, which is basically all the situations in which a quarterback puts the ball in a dangerous position. So this is the sum of interceptions plus passes defended. That tends to be a much better predictor of interceptions. And Ryan Tannehill, um, only during his time during Tennessee, let's not even let's not even count the years that he was with the the NFL quarterback morgue keeper and Adam Gase in, in Miami. Um, he's at a bad ball rate of 13.3%. And that's significantly higher than the NFL average of, of 11.3%. In contrast, he's been really good with turnovers. Uh, he's only thrown interceptions on 1.8% of his passes in his time at Tennessee. That's lower than the NFL average of 2.4%. So just like Carson Wentz last year, I'm predicting that Tannehill is going to have a rougher season. Um, you know, he's been excellent in EPA per dropback. When you look at the metrics that, that Ben Baldwin uh, tracks over at whatever his site is, uh, go check it out. Um, but part of that is, you know, I mean, interceptions are very minus uh, expected points plays, right? So so when you're getting fortunate, which is what my analysis said, he's gotten fortunate over the last couple of years in terms of throwing interceptions. He does put the ball in dangerous positions, and, you know, we expect that to regress. And then, you know, Tennessee's uh, defense was a complete dumpster fire uh, last year. And so in some sense, they're kind of starting over. They got rid of cornerback Malcolm Butler. Um, when we're looking at their secondary, they signed Janoris Jenkins, who's definitely a good average NFL cornerback, but he is 32 years old. Um, they're kind of, uh, starting, uh, they're looking to rely on Kristen Fulton, who was a second round draft pick in, in 2020 at the other cornerback slot. He was hurt a lot last year. And then the, the other guy that they're potentially relying on back there is Caleb Fairley, who is a rookie that is um, a high ceiling type of cornerback, but also a guy who had back surgery, uh, I, I believe, within the last 12 months. So how are they? Yeah. What's that? He's, I think he's had a couple within the past think, couple of months. I think, he, oh, has he had a couple back surgeries? He's yeah, had at he least had an one ACL back surgery. at some point. I think he's had two back surgeries. It's at least It's at least one, but there's potentially a couple in there. Yeah, and he didn't play football in, in 2020. 
Um, so when I look at who they're relying on in that secondary, it doesn't give me a ton of confidence that that they can come back. I mean, they did they did add some pieces to the pass rush, which I which I think will help. Um, they did add uh, obviously Julio Jones on the offensive side of the ball, so they are kind of in a win now mode. But I I, I don't see it happening. I think they're very, they're going to be a very average team. Um, so I, I took the under, uh, under nine wins at FanDuel, which was actually plus 125, which I think is a pretty good price right now. And, um, yeah, that's what I'm going with today. So I'm curious, uh, two things. First of all, does the fact that Janoris Jenkins now wants to be called Jackrabbit change oh your God. assessment of their secondary? Does Jackrabbit Jenkins move the needle for you? Jackrabbit Jenkins annoys me because that's what he's listed at. Uh, on PFF, which made it difficult for me to Wait, find. He actually is listed as Jackrabbit now. You cannot find anyone under the name Janoris on on the PFF database. So he's actually going as Jackrabbit. This, this is I thought it was just a nickname. I, I, I don't know if that means he's actually going by Jackrabbit, but that's what he's listed at in PFF. I feel like that's got to be worth at least half a win, though, right? What his presence? What his name? No, no, the name Jackrabbit, not his presence. Like the the <laughs> name Jackrabbit. That's at least half a win to me. Um, I, I think having uh, him play 17 games and being above average, at least an average NFL cornerback, that might be worth half a win. Okay, well, I'm going to go with the Jackrabbit name itself, not the play. This is Jackrabbit. <laughs> uh, second question is Tennessee is currently plus 130 to miss the playoffs. Right. I think that that does not, it's kind of similar to the Broncos discussion where liking their under does not necessarily lead you towards betting the, them to miss the playoffs. Sure. Plus 130, I think, is a very reasonable number. But the problem is, if you're betting the Titans terrible. to miss, you got to concoct someone else to win the AFC South. And yep. that's tough. Uh, it is. So are you staying away from that number and just betting the win total here? Yeah. I think we're, I think we're going to go with the win total. Um, okay. But, you know, I mean, it, you know, Tennessee did win the division last year, right? I believe I'm so. pretty sure. It was, I'm, no, I'm, yeah, because Indy was on the road in, in the first round of the playoffs. They were against Buffalo. Yeah. So, so. Oh, right. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a, there's certainly going to be division winners that don't win. And I, I would put Tennessee as one of the more likely ones um, to do not win their division. Okay. So, Ed likes Tennessee under nine. My cover in the future for this week is actually something Nick covered tangentially. He discussed it in passing, but, as we discussed previously, you can't take a ton out of what you see in the preseason. But the one difference for me, the one thing I do care about is usage. And teams show you the players they want to feature and who will get volume for the season. And it really seems like the Jets are going to get Corey Davis involved heavily. So I like the over 825.5 80, receiving yards with minus 112 on the over right now for Davis's season-long prop. So far in this preseason, Davis has run 13 routes according to Next Gen Stats. He has been targeted on 10 of those 13 routes. No other player who has run at least 10 routes has been targeted on more than half their routes. And Davis is at like 76%. So obviously that's not going to stick, but it does show they are scheming him touches and getting the ball. And it shows that Zach Wilson trusts him and has a rapport built up with Davis already. Now, it is worth noting that Elijah Moore, their second round rookie, who was tremendous in mini camps, has not played yet. He's been getting rave reviews in practice, but he also hasn't played because he had an injury, which means he missed time, key practice time, developing with Wilson, getting that chemistry. Davis hasn't, and it looks like he has taken full advantage here. The Jets don't have a tight end here to take away targets. That's of maybe some Tyler Croft dump offs again. Uh, their backs are not monsters in the passing game. So even if Moore does carve out a significant role here, it might not matter at all in terms of trying to get Corey Davis above a twenty half, a twenty five and a half. Number fires Davis at eight hundred eighty eight yards. That doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room, but I think that might be underselling him if they do want to skewing towards an over team, as Nick alluded to with uh, Carl Lawson's injury. They also uh, draw Davis uh, on the, the uh, at the linebacker. He's also banged up. They could be a team that has to you know make up some deficits. I've got them as a five point nine win team. That could bode well for some passing as well. So. I am down to go here and check, take the over and hope that the preseason chemistry between Davis and Wilson carries over into the regular season. And I think that Nick's analysis there was correct. And I agree with it where the Jets could be a team that is a bit more high scoring or the games could be more high scoring than perception, given how good Wilson has looked, given the Lawson injury, the Davis injury and stuff like that. So I think that uh, Corey Davis over 825 and a half, pretty attractive for me. Uh, Ed, any thoughts for you on the Jets so far? Obviously, 
too too early to tell on Zach Wilson stuff like that. But just broad thoughts on this team entering twenty twenty one. Yeah, I haven't I haven't done my deep dive yet, but I I'm always gonna fade rookie quarterbacks. I think that's just kind of a you know, I mean obviously that doesn't work out with the Justin Herbert sometimes. Um, but Justin Herbert the, is more the exception, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it gives you an opportunity to fade him in year two as uh, the football outsiders uh, people are this season. So yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, they, I I think I, I don't know. I I don't think of them much as a team right now. I don't know if they're going to be worse than Detroit in my mind because Detroit might be the worst team in, in football, as I talked about mm-hmm. last year. Uh, sorry, last week. But um, but I mean, th- that might be a good thing because they'll be down. They'll be throwing a lot and uh, that'll give a lot of opportunities to get yards. Yeah, that's the goal here, and just the the rapport seems really good. So Corey Davis over eight twenty five and a half, uh, the first Jets future I've got for this year. That is all the time that we have here for today on covering the spread. Once again, big thank you to Nick Costos for swinging by. Check him out on Twitter at the Costos, and check out you better you bet on Odyssey or where, wherever you get your podcasts. As well, because I do post it after the fact uh, as well. Uh, big thank you to Nick as always. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, the big thing is that we launched the preview series on the Football Analytics Show. So episode three went up today. It's Edward Egros talking about Heisman odds. Probably the best episode. It's going to be on the entire series. It's really good. So I highly recommend that you go check out the one thing about uh, Heisman betting that he's uh, dug up from uh, historical data. So uh, that's the Football Analytics Show. And then, yeah, over at the Power Rank, I'm still writing my sports betting email newsletter it's a free service uh check it out at thepowerrank.com all right make sure you follow ed on twitter as well at the power rank and again the uh the preview series the football analytics show wherever you get your podcasts i am on twitter at jim sanas j-i-m-s-a-n-n-e-s you can also follow the fanduel podcast network at fanduel podcast big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today good luck to you with your bets this weekend if you're betting the preseason as the final week wraps up here good luck with the nfl futures and for week zero of college football we'll talk to you once again next week this has been covering the spread right here on the fanduel podcast network aaron dolan here thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great fanduel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here